Now we're going to take a look at a next level up of structuring data where we have two-dimensional arrays or arrays of arrays. A uh, two-dimensional array is a doubly indexed sequence of values of the same type. And these are familiar. Uh, if you've done math calculations with matrices, uh, or if we have a table, say we have students and grades, then we have a two-dimensional array, two indices to access uh, an element which would be a grade. Uh, scientific experiments, uh, uh, th th there might be an index by time and an index by an experiment. Uh, Transactions for bank customers. There's the customer and then which transaction it is. We'll look at this one later on. Pixels in a digital image. This in image has got an X coordinate and a Y coordinate, which are just indices, and then uh, each value of the coordinates specifies a pixel, uh, and the thing there is a color. Uh, or geographic data, there's many, many applications. And again, just as with one-dimensional arrays, we want to facilitate storage and manipulation of this data. And with two indices, we have uh, more flexibility for uh, data that calls for it. Uh, so Java also has language support for two-dimensional arrays. Uh, again, basic support uh, that uh, extends the one-dimensional array support in a natural way. So to declare a two-dimensional array, we put uh, a sequence of two open and closed braces. That says A is going to be a two-dimensional two array of uh, values of type double. Uh, to create one of a given size, uh, we put numbers in there and we use the new construct. So if A has been declared, this says create a new two-dimensional array, a thousand by thousand array. Uh, and then to refer an array entry by index, uh, we just put any, after the uh, name of the two-dimensional array, uh, we put a, a row name inside uh, brackets and a column name inside brackets. Uh, refer to the number of rows, that's a dot length, and the number of columns is a of i dot length, and that can be different for each row. Uh, that's a little more advanced than we need to get right now, but we put it here for uh, completeness. Uh, to refer to row i, that's a of i, and there's no good way to refer to column j, and that's just the way that the arrays are implemented. Uh, in Java, there are arrays of arrays, and once you understand that, then uh, you can see these. So this is a 3 by 10 array, array with uh, three rows and 10 columns. Uh, and we think of it as laid out in this row major order, uh, where we put all the elements in each row. Uh, one after the other, and then, and then the columns uh, are vertical. Uh, okay, and then maybe we think of that first thing as being the name A. Again, it's the real world is slightly more complicated than that. Okay, what about initializing? Again, uh, if we write code like A equals new double, a thousand, a thousand, uh, that's uh, a million different elements, uh, and they're all initialized to 0, 0.0. Uh, if they're ints, they're initialized to 0. If they're booleans, uh, they're initialized to false. Uh, and we can declare, create, initialize uh, in a single statement uh, in a similar way. Uh, and we can also do literal values. So uh, it's an array of, of arrays, so we put uh, uh, curly brackets, uh, and then uh, we just put the rows within curly brackets separated by commas. Uh, again, to initialize to zero, you don't have to have nested loops uh, like you uh, might expect and which you do need in many other languages, uh, but you have to really be sure you take into account that the cost of creating an array is proportional to its size. Uh, okay, so uh, one uh, application is vector and matrix calculations. Uh, and these are very familiar to uh, most of you, and we won't uh, dwell on it for now, uh, but it's certainly uh, a natural application of arrays. Uh, so uh, if we have two arrays, A and B, uh, that are both of length N, uh, then we can create a new array of uh, C of that same length, and then add those two uh, vectors, A and B, uh, to get the result for C. Uh, and uh, so it's just a term by term add. Uh, or if you have a matrix, uh, then you use a two dimensional array. Uh, and then uh, you have to, for every i, for every j, 
uh, do the term by term add. So each entry uh, gets added to create the corresponding entry on the right. So that's just a very uh, simple uh, vector and matrix calculation. With vectors and matrices, we have more complicated computation, like for vectors, the dot product, uh, one-dimensional array, uh, you uh, multiply the corresponding entries and add them all up. Uh, so this is just a little trace for uh, these two uh, vectors, one-dimensional vectors. Uh, uh, first uh, entry, zero, both of them, is uh, x of i is 0.3, y of i is 0.5. You multiply them together, you get 0.15. And then do that for one, you get 0.06, and you add it to the sum. Uh, and then the third one, you add it. And so the dot product of those two uh, vectors is 0 0.25. And you get that for vectors with a single for loop. Uh, with matrices, the corresponding thing is maybe matrix multiplication. Uh, and uh, if you're familiar with matrix multiplication, you immediately see uh, how this code works. And if you're not, you can look in the book for more details. It's the dot product. Uh, I and J is the dot product of row I and column J uh, in the result. So those two give that same result from over there. And that fills in one entry of the matrix. Uh, in this case, it's a triple for loop. Uh, for every entry in the output, uh, you have to do a dot product of uh, two vectors uh, in the, uh, the row and the column uh, in the input matrices. So that's an example of two-dimensional uh, arrays used to implement a familiar matrix computation. Uh, just a quick question, how many multiplies, multiplications do you need to multiply two n by n matrices? And you look at this code just for a second, and you see, well, it's a triple loop, each one executed n times. So the answer is uh, n times n times n. Uh, that's uh, n cubed to multiply two n by n matrices. Uh, okay, so let's look at uh, another simulation example. Uh, so uh, here we imagine a dog uh, that's wandering, on, that's lost and wandering around uh, in a city that's uh, all square city blocks. Uh, uh, in the, it, being a dog, uh, it knows to, it's a waste of time to uh, revisit any intersection and it can know when it's, been, when it's going to a place that it's been before and won't go there. Uh, so the question is, does the dog ever get out of the city or not? Uh, so what we're going to do is have a, a, a random process in an n by n lattice. We're going to start in the middle. Uh, and we're going to move to a random neighboring intersection, and, but never revisiting anywhere. And there's two possible things that can happen is, one, you get out of the city, uh, but the other is you get stuck in a dead end. And let's look at an example. So we start in the middle, and in this case, uh, move west, move west again, and then north, and then east, and then north, and so forth randomly choosing a direction. Now at that point, it couldn't go back that way because it's already, it couldn't go back west because it's already been there. Now it goes south, uh, and then it goes east. And in this case, uh, looks good, but now it's not gonna go west again uh, because it's already been there. Uh, so there's only one of possible, two possible things it could do. Uh, it goes up uh, north, uh, so that means it escapes. Uh, on the other hand, with this one, uh, after going for a while, uh, the dog has the chance to escape uh, if it goes south, uh, but in this case it chooses to go north, uh, and that means a dead end. That dog's stuck in all the neighboring intersections he's already been to. So the question is, what are the chances of hitting a dead end? And again, with arrays, we can address this question with simulation. Uh, we're going to use Monte Carlo simulation. We're going to now, in the QCon collector, we had a one-dimensional array. In this, we're going to have a two-dimensional array of the places that we've been. And with all the code that we've seen in this setup, uh, you can, uh, this code uh, almost writes itself. You can uh, quickly see what we're going to want to do. Uh, this is uh, uh, a bunch of random walks. Uh, and you can see, uh, in this case, uh, uh, there's uh, 8 by 48 of them, and 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 of them are uh, dead ends, uh, and the rest of them, the dog uh, escapes. Uh, so we want to do a lot of random walks, and we want to calculate the proportion uh, for which the dog uh, gets uh, stuck. 
So uh, again, this is a, the same setup. We, this is a third time now that we've used this setup. Uh, we're going to take our problem size from the command line. We're going to take the number of trials that we want to do for the, from the command line. Uh, we're going to initiate a count of the variable that we care about, which is the number of time it reaches dead ends. And then we're going to go into a for loop to do our experiment uh, uh, trials times and just use a variable t to just keep count of the number of trials that we've done. And so what do we do for our experiment? We create a Boolean array, an n by n Boolean array. And again, Java automatically uh, initializes that to false, every entry to false. Uh, and then we'll start, keep our coordinates uh, x and y uh, for our starting point. Uh, and that's going to be uh, in the middle at n over 2, n over 2. And then uh, this while loop, the condition on the while loop is that x can't be 0 and x can't be n minus 1 and y can't be 0 and y can't be n minus 1. Because any one of those conditions means that the dog escaped. Uh, and then uh, the, what's the condition that the dog is stuck? Uh, the condition is that uh, every neighboring place has been visited. So that's if I'm at xy, x minus 1y, uh, x plus 1y are the ones to the east and west, and xy minus 1 and xy plus 1 are the ones to the north, north and south. Uh, so uh, if they're uh, all, uh, if I've been to all those places before, then I just increment, I know I'm at a dead end, and I just increment that and break. Uh, otherwise, I, I set this position to be true and say, okay, I'm here, I've been here. Uh, I generate a random number, and then I just take four cases of whether that number is less than a quarter, between a quarter and a half, uh, between a half and three quarters, between three quarters and one, all of those equally likely. Uh, and uh, if the neighbor in that direction, uh, if I haven't been there before, then I go there, either by incrementing or decrementing x, or by incrementing or decrementing y. Uh, so uh, that's my, uh, my experiment. I either get out of that by incrementing dead ends or not incrementing uh, dead ends. Uh, and then when I'm done, after doing all the trials, I just print out the, the percentage of dead ends, which is the number of dead ends divided by the number of trials. A pretty short program, but for a big value of n in trials, uh, it's a huge amount of computation. Uh, and it can help us address this question of what's the chance that I reach a dead end. Uh, so uh, if I do it for, uh, again, this time I'm doing 100,000 trials. Uh, and if I do a, a 10 by 10 grid, uh, then I have a 5% chance of reaching dead ends. A good chance of getting out. As the grid gets bigger, uh, I've got a much bigger chance of getting stuck in a dead end gets to be 30, it gets to be 58%, 40, it gets to be 77%. Uh, and after a while, when the grid is really huge, I have uh, really uh, not much chance of, of getting out. The size of 100, it's more than 99% uh, dead ends. Uh, and I can go ahead and plot that and get an idea for uh, what the chances are for various grid sizes. Uh, this seems a little bit like a, a whimsical problem, but this is uh, actually uh, very, uh, in, uh, like many such problems, uh, there's very important uh, applications uh, in science. Uh, so uh, that's our problem. Uh, it's been used to model the behavior of polymers and, and solvents, uh, and actually a uh, Nobel Prize was won for uh, study of associated uh, phenomenon. Uh, and physics of magnetic materials and many other physical phenomena. So it's an important problem that scientists want to understand. Uh, what's the probability of reaching a dead end? And you might be surprised to know that nobody knows. People have been studying this for a long time, and uh, we don't have a mathematical model for telling us uh, the shape of that curve uh, that we just plotted uh, in your uh, one of your early programming lectures. Uh, so uh, we know from our simulations uh, uh, pretty clearly that uh, it's going to be 99% plus for uh, big values uh, of n. And the point that I want to make is that not only can computer simulation be pretty easy, you, you as a beginning programmer can learn to do it, but it's actually often on the only effective way to study a scientific phenomenon. 
That's why we have this heavy emphasis on simulation at the beginning of this course. Uh, it's a very well motivated application of simple programming techniques uh, and it's important because it's often the only way to do, uh, to make an effective study of a scientific phenomenon. So uh, let's uh, summarize briefly. Uh, arrays are a very basic building block in programming. They uh, let us store uh, large amounts of data, values of all the same type. Uh, we can instantly access a given piece of data with index or indices in two-dimensional arrays. Uh, and we'll see later how this efficiency derives from the way that uh, computer hardware uh, is organized. And we're going to see several more applications later in this course, uh, from a shift register for cartography to di digital audio to processing uh, digital images uh, to simulating uh, in bodies uh, in, in physics. Uh, so all of those things with this one data structure and we're going to study other data structures as well.